Jesus, again, we, we thank you for your word and we thank you for uh, your Holy Spirit, which illuminates your word. We know that, that you put these words here for a reason. Even the people that are mentioned that we might think are just casual mentions, uh, nothing is casual, nothing is accidental with you. Your word is, is purposeful, sharper than any two-edged sword. We can discern truth from everything in here, Lord. Even when we don't understand it initially, we know it's here for your purposes, and we thank you for your word. We again thank you for uh, this class, for those who have come eager to hear, eager to learn, that we could take what we learn today and we can exercise it out in the world and the, with the people that we come in contact with. We pray a special blessing on Zach and his whole family, Lord. We, we thank you, Jesus, for Zach. We thank you for his, his uh, diligence in the word, Lord, his commitment to this class and to these people whom he loves. We, we thank you for his heart that he takes so much time to dig deeper into the word. For, for many of us, it's, it's hard, it's harder. We don't dig that deep always, Lord. We, we all have a heart for you. That's our cry, that our heart would be softened but we thank you for Zach, for the blessings that he can give, Lord, that we can learn from him and that we too can grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord as he encourages us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Tim. Oh, yes. Praise be to God and glory to him, right, for everything. So thank you, Father, for strengthening me such an honor to preach his word and to teach his word. These are not my words, but just his words speaking through me. And so I'm very honored and excited that we are finishing up our, our study on 2 Timothy. Um, you know, like I said before, you know, this, this book has been such an amazing study, you know. I never would have actually dreamed that we would have spent 26 lessons on a little four-chapter book, uh, but it's just leading, you know, as the Holy Spirit leads, you know. So it's just been really exciting as, as we've been stu studying this and learning about the life of Timothy and the life of Paul in this. So, so this will be fun to wrap up this book and, and see where we go from here. But um, so today we're wrapping up the study. And what we're seeing is we're seeing this next round of people that, that he mentions, as we just read, and, and he mentions this in his final salutation. And this is the final salutation of the book, and it's also the final salutation of his entire life. And I think these are some, something that we need to keep in mind as we're going through this today, is that these are the last words that, Tim, that uh, Paul will ever write in his life um, that, that he inspired by the Holy Spirit that the God chose to put in his divine word. And so these are precious words that we're about ready to read here as we finalize this. So two weeks ago, we've been looking at these 17 names from section nine through 22. And you know, these are not just a list of names. These are people who we can see or we're seeing them as Paul saw them as, as brothers and sisters in Christ and even some who betrayed him and abandoned him. But he's, these, are, these are people that are precious to him. And so a couple of weeks ago, we, we read about um, seven of these, the first seven people. And we started out in verse nine. And then last week we learned about Alexander the coppersmith, the betrayer. And we saw how his, his, you know, his arrest, how that led to his arrest and the first defense in the Roman court. And then finally leading to his conviction and, and Paul's martyrdom. So today we're looking at the remaining nine people and then the final closing statements to his son in the faith, Timothy. And so these are dear brethren to the apostle Paul. And so he's saying this before he departs his life into eternal life. You know, he's only, you know, I mean, he, he tells us that he has, he thinks he has before winter. Nobody really knows how long he has from the time he wrote these, these words, but it's, you know, months probably. It's probably weeks or months before he write, writes these words and then he actually goes off to be with the Lord. And so th we can see, as we saw in verse 18, how Paul changed his mindset to eternal life. He had this mindset of eternal life, uh, you know, is where we saw that focus go. And so now then he's just wrapping up with these greetings and a final 
farewell greeting to Timothy. And, and so this, these are precious words. And so in this, we saw this, that he's not only saying goodbye, and that's what I was seeing as I was reading this this week. He's not just saying goodbye or a final greeting. That is what he's da- doing. But he's also handing off the mantle to his son in the faith, Timothy. He's, the, the concern of the churches that he always bore, he's now handing off to, I believe it's Timothy. I believe Timothy is the one that's ordained to carry this burden of all the churches, the concern for all the churches. And I think that's what we see here as we see we, us come to a close. And so we just see this deep love that Paul had for all this brethren. Now, one thing I want us to remember as we're going through these final verses is that this is a very personal letter to his son in the faith, Timothy. He's writing this letter to Timothy, and we've seen that overall. You know, there's been these double emphatics to say, you, Timothy, you do this. I'm writing this to you personally. Now, we have the honor of reading this, and God intended that we would read this and apply it to our lives, but I think contextually, we need to know that this is, this is a letter written personally to Timothy. So we want to keep that in mind. It's a heartfelt letter to his son in the faith to be watchful, to be ready to suffer evil affliction, to work and be an evangelist, to do the work of an evangelist, to preach the word and to fulfill his ministry. That's the the charge that that Paul is writing to his son in the faith here. And so as we read this final conclusion, I want you to see the hope that Paul has in, in these words of that these may not be the final words he actually says to Timothy. He has a hope that he would actually, Timothy would come see him one final time before he departs this life. And so that's this, this yearning that we actually see as we, as we finish up this letter. So the first two names that we come across today in our study begin in verse 19. And we see Priscilla and Aquila and so we also see the household of Anesiphorus. And so whenever we, whenever we read that, he says, greet Prissa and Aquila, or greet Priscilla and Aquila, and he says the whole household of Anesiphorus. Now, he's saying greet these people, and he's writing to Timothy, and Timothy is stationed in Ephesus, and so he's telling Timothy to greet these people. That tells us that these people are living in Ephesus. So just to get context, we, we're, we're going to be talking about several people here, and it's interesting to know where are they now in the context of this letter, and so Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Anesiphorus are in Ephesus as Paul is writing this letter. And so he says, he says to Timothy, make sure you greet these people for me. So every one of these, bro- these brethren that we're listing here, and, and really a lot of the 17 names that we're listing, have a tie back to the church of Ephesus. And that's what's kind of interesting whenever you really see this, is that these are all people, this is a personal letter to Timothy, and all these people tie back to either the Ephesus or to Timothy personally himself. And so we can just see the personal uh, touch that Paul has towards Timothy. So the first people that we're going to talk about is Priscilla and Aquila. Now it's listed as Prissa and Aquila. And some people have wondered, well, why did he, why did he write Prissa instead of Priscilla? Well, from what I can read and what I've studied, you know, this Prissa is just a shortened version of the name Priscilla. It's definitely this couple, this group, Priscilla and Aquila, their husband and wife. And it's definitely those two. And as, and we can see that they are in Ephesus and they've been in Ephesus. They've, they've had a house church in Ephesus uh, before. They're brethren of Paul. They're brethren of Timothy. And so we know that this is, this is just like saying, you know, Zach instead of Zachariah. Prissa, I believe, is just a shortened version of Priscilla. So this, this is Priscilla and Aquila. And so uh, Paul first meets this couple uh, on his second missionary journey whenever he travels to Corinth, and this is in 52 AD. And so Aquila and his wife Priscilla, they had come from Italy, from Rome, because Claudius, the Roman emperor, had commanded that all the Jews depart Rome and they had to flee somewhere. They couldn't be in Rome anymore. And so a little bit of history about who Claudius, Claudius, this, uh, this emperor was, he reigned from 41 to 54 AD, and he he was, the, uh, he was the, the Roman emperor that actually it told these Jews that they couldn't be in Rome anymore. And we have a, a Roman historian that actually wrote, he, his name is Suetonius, and he's recorded to have written this. He says, in the ninth year of Claudius' reign, which if that's the ninth year, that would have been 50 AD, because he started reigning in 41. So in 50 AD, in the ninth year of Claudius' reign, the Jews were expelled from Rome at the instigation of constant tumults concerning Christ. 
So that's, and that's no new, that's no new news, right? The Jews were hostile towards Christians. I mean, we saw that, of course, towards Jesus, you know, towards, uh, you know, Stephen, towards all the martyrs there, you know, they were constantly, these unbelieving Jews were constantly following Paul, trying to stir things up. They were constantly stirring the crowds up. So evidently they, they did, they were doing the same thing in Rome to these Christians. And the Claudius was like, that's enough of that. You can't can't live here anymore. And so he expelled all the Jews out of the city of Rome and wouldn't let them live there. So that would have uh, also, that's uh, the, any Jewish Christians, because the Roman Empire, they have no concern for, you know, the details of Christianity, right? So they're just saying, okay, if you're a Jew by heritage, you're out of here. They're not letting, they're not trying to decide, are you a Jewish Christian or are you a Jew? So they expelled the Jewish Christians. And I believe that, that um, Priscilla and Aquila were born again. They were, they were followers of Christ, even in Rome here. That's, they didn't get converted by Paul. I believe that they were already born again whenever the time Paul met him. So, so they they had to flee out from Rome because of that, um, because they got expelled. So in Rome, let's just mark on this. We got some maps here. So this is Rome. We see it over here. So where did they go? Well, we find out that they go to Corinth. And so Corinth is right here. So they travel and they go down and they end up landing in Corinth. Now in Corinth, they're in Corinth from about 50, to 50 AD to 54 AD. And in that time period, they actually set up a house church. And I think that's so fun seeing the, the Priscilla and Aquila, their ministry was everywhere they went, they set up a church in their house. They opened up their house to the brethren and they welcomed in, them in. And, and it's just such a, a great example of what a husband and wife team can do with the brethren. And they constantly, in every place that they went, will see that they opened up uh, their church, their house as a church to these people. So they did that in Corinth. Now in 52 AD, whenever Paul's traveling on a second missionary journey, he meets or he's introduced to Pr Priscilla and Aquila. This is the first time he meets them and he meets them in Corinth. And this is about 52 AD. Now in 52 AD, he comes into Corinth and he, he sees, he meets uh, Priscilla and Aquila. They're Christians. They're preaching the gospel. And, and then he also sees that they have the same occupation. They're tent makers. So Paul was a tent maker and so was Priscilla and Aquila. And whether they had their own business or they just knew how to, how to they were obviously smart people that knew how to take care of things. And so they, they were able to have a house and economically, you know, function in, in the city. And so they, um, they probably did that by having a business, you know, building tents or some type of leather work. And so Paul also had that same trade. So he ends up uh, doing that with him whenever he can. And so then we see that he, uh, Paul stays in, in Corinth for about a, a year and a half. And he's probably, this is my guess, it doesn't say this in the word, but but he probably stays with Priscilla and Aquila. You know, I mean, he, they're opening up the house. I think Paul might have been staying with them as well. And so they, they begin to, to really know each other. And so then as Paul travels on a second missionary journey, he, he, his next stop is Ephesus, which is right there. So they just travel across and Paul wants to go to Ephesus. Now they must have gotten such a bond between Priscilla and, Priscilla and Aquila and Paul that they, tr Priscilla and Aquila actually, actually follow the apostle Paul to Ephesus. So I think that's kind of neat. They lived in Corinth for four years. They meet Paul and now they're learning the way of Jesus Christ, you know, probably even more now that they have Paul with, with them they've been with him for about two years. Now they travel with him and they, they land in Ephesus. And so in Ephesus, um, right at the end of Paul's second missionary journey, Paul can't stay very long. So then he go, heads back to Jerusalem, but Priscilla and Aquila actually stay in Ephesus. And again, what do they do? They they have their house and they open up their house as a church again. So we'll, we see that in the word. And so while Paul is, is back, um, you know, getting ready for his third missionary journey and he leave and uh, Aquila and Priscilla stay in Ephesus, they meet a guy named Apollos and we've heard about Apollos and Apollos knew the ways of John the Baptist, but it says in Acts 18 that they explained to, to Apollos the way of God more accurately. This was Aquila and Priscilla doing that to Apollos. And I mentioned that because it shows that these were leaders in the church. They knew the gospel they, and they had spent some time with Paul. And so they knew the way of Christianity. They knew the way of God. And so they're leaders in the church. They're opening up their houses to the brethren and they're, they're helping people learn more about Jesus Christ. And I think that's kind of fun. Shows these people who they are in Christ. And so they're very knowledgeable in Christianity and they're also leaders. And so then now Paul comes back 
back to Ephesus, you know, after he's traveling over and he goes to Jerusalem and then on his third missionary journey, if you remember, he travels up, he leaves from Antioch and then he goes up, I believe he went up around and he kind of hit the churches of Galatia, but then he lands in Ephesus again and that's whenever he's in Ephesus for three years at this point on his third missionary journey. And so then he no doubt goes back and meets Priscilla and Aquila again and he's there for three years in Ephesus. And during those three years, after the, f- after the first two years in 56 AD, he actually writes, Paul writes the, what we know as the first letter to the Corinthians. Now he wrote several letters to the Corinthian church. And so here he writes, we see Priscilla and Aquila mentioned in 1 Corinthians. So I'm going to flip over there and read that to you. Because in 1 Corinthians 16.9 or 16.19, he mentions Priscilla and Aquila. And so if we go to 1 Corinthians 16.9, he says, he's, he's speaking to the church at Corinth, and he says, the churches of Asia greet you. Now, this area, you can see this area was Asia Minor, and so the, he says, the churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So that shows that they have a church in the house. All the brethren greet you, greet one another with a holy kiss. So that tells us that whenever he wrote the book of 1 Corinthians, which is about 56 AD, that, that Priscilla and Aquila were still in Ephesus. Okay. So they're still in Ephesus here, but then as you go on and you study the Paul's travels, we see that in about 57 AD, Paul goes on and, and from Ephesus, he actually leaves and he goes up to Macedonia and he picks up Timothy in Macedonia. And so that's in about 57 AD. But then we, if you read things carefully, you see that Aquila and Priscilla also leave Ephesus and it, it looks like they travel all the way back to Rome again. So in 57 AD, once Paul leaves, it looks like Aquila and Priscilla also leave and they go back to their hometown in Rome. And the reason why we know that is because when Paul left and he went up to Macedonia, he did that to go grab Timothy and then they come back at together and they come back to Corinth and Paul writes the letter to the Romans in Corinth at around 58 AD. So he writes this letter about a year after he leaves Ephesus and then we find that in Romans, if we go to Romans 16.3, we see Priscilla and Aquila mentioned again. And so this tells us that now he's writing a letter to Rome, to the church in Rome, and he says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ, who risked their, li- their own necks for my life. So here, he, now we see Priscilla and Aquila, now no longer in, in Ephesus or Corinth, they're actually back in Rome again, because he's writing to the church in Rome, and this is in 58 AD, about a year after Paul had left. So this tells us that, that they went back and they went to their hometown in Rome. Now, we don't really hear much of anything else from Priscilla and Aquila until this letter of 2 Timothy. But in 2 Timothy now, he says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, and he's telling Timothy this. Well, that means that they went back to Ephesus. So when do you think they went back to Ephesus? You know, as I was thinking about this, they're in Rome. Well, remember in 64 AD, whenever Nero blamed Christians for burning down Rome, it was probably very impossible to live in Rome. And so my thought, my conjecture is that probably after that, it was so hostile in Rome, they left again and they went from Rome and they traveled all the way back again to Ephesus. And that's where we see him now in second Timothy being, being with Timothy in the church of Ephesus. And so that's the, uh, that's the, the life say uh, map of these two, but everywhere they went, they made a house church. I think that is so inspiring. They opened up their house and everywhere where they went, they made sure they preached the gospel and they, they did that with love and, and they accepted the brethren. So pretty fun seeing about those people. So they're obviously brethren of the Apostle Paul and of our, of our Christian faith. So now we get into Anesiphorus. Now, Anesiphorus has a fun story. We don't see much of him mentioned because he's only mentioned in 2 Timothy. And we see him at the chapter 1 and then now in chapter 4. First time we see him mentioned is in 2 Timothy 1.16. So I'm going to flip over there. 2 Timothy 1.16, we see Paul, he says... He says, the Lord grant mercy to the household of Anesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. 
The Lord grant to him that he might find mercy from the Lord in that day, and you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. So this Anesiphorus, very devout, diligent brother, didn't worry about his life coming to see the Apostle Paul. And so Paul's mentioning this to him. And so we know that Anesiphorus, he must have lived in Ephesus because his household is in Ephesus. And so, because he told him, and then we also see in verse 18, he says, you know very well how much he ministered to me at Ephesus. So we know Anesiphorus was originally from Ephesus. And so Anesiphorus diligently sought Paul out in the dungeon in Rome. You know, he, he had a heart to go see the Apostle Paul and diligently seek him out. And you can see how much that meant the Apostle Paul because he says he refreshed me and he wasn't ashamed of my chains and he refreshed me and I would say he refreshed him physically and spiritually you know back in those days if you're in a dungeon you weren't getting you know provisions for you know nutrition and health you know water and those types of things unless somebody gave them to you so the, I believe that Onesiphorus refreshed him physically by bringing him probably food and water and also spiritually because it lifted his spirits to so that he wasn't alone Remember, we've gone through that, how, how many people actually did desert him and they didn't stand with him. And so Anesiphorus was one of those people that stood with him. Now, Anesiphorus is, is mentioned ag again now in f chapter 4, but this is interesting. I want you to read this closely because in chapter 4, it, Paul's not talking about Anesiphorus specifically. He's talking about the household of Anesiphorus, his household. So he says, greet the household of Anesiphorus. Now, if you go back and if you look at this, he does the same thing in verse 16. He says, the Lord grant mercy to the household of Anesiphorus. And then he goes on and he explains the heroic acts of how, you know, Anesiphorus went up and sought him diligently. So this is interesting. He's asking that the Lord grant mercy to the household of Anesiphorus. And if you read it closely, everywhere where Anesiphorus is mentioned, it's in the past tense. It's in the aorist indicative. It's actually past tense, and it stayed in the past. So this is my hunch. I think Anesiphorus gave his life for coming to see the Apostle Paul in Rome. Because he's saying, he doesn't mention Anesiphorus anymore in the present that he's living. I think he literally gave his life. He went and saw the Apostle Paul in, in the dungeon. And I, and I think that's that he gave his life for going to see him. What an amazing martyrdom story that this man would love the Apostle Paul and Christianity so much that he felt driven by the Holy Spirit to go see the Apostle Paul. And he gave his life for, for doing that. And, and if you read, Paul knows this and he says the Lord grant to him that he might find mercy from the Lord in that day at the Bema when he's standing before the righteous judge you know Anesiphorus is, is receiving the crown of righteousness because he loved the Apostle Paul he loved Jesus Christ and he ministered to him and refreshed him even in his chains so what a great story of Anesiphorus the next one is Eurastus I'm going to get a drink Okay, so Eurastus, it says in verse 20, Eurastus stayed in Corinth. So Eurastus, he's mentioned three times in the scripture. He's mentioned in Acts 19, Romans 16, and now here in 2 Timothy 4.20. Now, the first time we see him mentioned in Acts 19, 22, it's whenever he's with, he, the, he's uh, from Ephesus, or at least he's with uh, Timothy and, and, um, and Paul in Ephesus, and they get a, a, a charge, they get, the Apostle Paul sends Timothy and Eurastus to go up to Macedonia um, to go ahead and comfort them and, and strengthen the church up there. And so that was a charge that, that the Apostle Paul gave to Timothy, and it tells us that they, um, they, uh, that Erastus was with him. But if you read things carefully, again, this is why I love studying all these epistles and kind of charting out what I told you last week of seeing where these guys are going is on the way up to Macedonia, before they go up there, they actually shoot across and they go to Corinth and they drop off, they deliver the previous letter. And remember I told you that previous letter was the letter before 1 Corinthians that we, know we don't have, it's, it's not extant. But he delivers, they have record of that, that he delivered the previous previous letter and Erastus and Timothy were with, were, were together. And then from Corinth, they delivered that, that, um, 
that previous letter, and then they go north up to Macedonia. Now, uh, Timothy stays in Macedonia for a couple of years while, uh, while Paul is in Ephesus, but Eurastus isn't mentioned as being and staying in in Macedonia. So what happens, this is what I think, because I'm going to show you how this all ties together, is they, they go up and they, they spend a little bit of time up in Macedonia. Timothy stays there, but um, Eurastus comes back to Corinth. And the reason why I think Paul, uh, Eurastus comes back to Corinth is because, remember whenever we said that, uh, that the Apostle Paul, he left Ephesus and he went over and he, he wrote the book of um, I just look at my notes. There's a lot of details. <laughs> so whenever he wrote in the book of Romans and he wrote to the Roman church and he was in Corinth. So he's in Corinth. The apostle Paul is in Corinth and he's writing this letter to the Romans and, and he's giving his whole salutations. So in Romans 16, 23, we see Paul mention Eurastus. And look at how he mentions him. He doesn't say like he did with, uh, with Priscilla and Aquila. He doesn't say to greet them. He does it the, in a different way, saying that, that Eurastus is in Corinth when he's writing the letter to the Romans. So go to Romans 16 again. And Romans 16, 23, it says here, Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church greet you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greet you. So I think this is kind of interesting. We see now Erastus actually has a title. Erastus, the, the uh, let me just read it again, the treasurer of the city greets you. So he's writing to the church in Rome and he's in Corinth. We know he's in Corinth writing this letter and he says, Erastus, the city treasurer greets you. So this means that now, so if you see how, how this is all tying together, he was, he was, he was uh, left, he went up to Macedonia, then he came back into Corinth. He's been spending some time in Corinth, I think probably two or three years in Corinth, and he probably knew some people, whether he was from Corinth originally, he probably knew some people in Corinth, and now he has worked himself to be the treasurer of the city. He's got, kind of elevated himself up to a nice job here. Notice that Paul doesn't say anything bad about that. He just mentions that Eurastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. So this is neat because now Oikonomos, whenever you read that, the uh, treasurer of the city is Oikonomos. It means really a steward or a manager of the city is what he, what he says. Okay, so now then, we see that there, so now he's two or three years probably spending his time in Corinth. He's built himself up and he's, and he's in there. Now in 2 Timothy, it, he says, Eurastus stayed in Corinth. So in all three instances, you have Acts 19, Romans 16, and now in 2 Timothy, he's mentioned around Corinth this whole time and he stayed in Corinth. Well, why do you think he stayed in Corinth? because he's the treasurer of the city. He's the steward of the city. He's got a job to do, right? So he can't be a traveling missionary with the apostle Paul. He stayed in Corinth because he has this important job. That's, that's just me putting all the pieces together. But what's, what's kind of fun is we have archeology span to kind of help back this up and so this is called the Erastus Stone. Over in, in Corinth, in 1929, excavators were digging and they discovered that lying underneath the Corinthian theater, they discovered this Latin inscription and this Latin inscription they call the Erastus Stone and it's got Erastus' name on it. And it, it's written in Latin, but in the English translation of this Latin inscription is, Erastus, in return for being a commissioner of public works, laid the pavement at his own expense. So, he, so here this stone says that Eurastus was a commissioner of public works. Could that be the same thing as a steward of the city? Very possibly it could. I think that this is, this is you know, archaeology in kind of backing up what we see. And this is in Corinth, and he was obviously a, a very prominent person. He actually laid this stone at his own expense, so he was a well-to-do guy. And so I think that's kind of fun that if, you, if that's the case, then that, that kind of confirms that these are the same people. And so you see that now Eurastus ha couldn't go and couldn't leave and travel with the Apostle Paul because he has an important job to do. I think this is kind of a great example for us. 
the, you know, we can't all quit our jobs and go travel and be missionaries around the world. Some of us have important jobs that we have to be at. And Eurastus, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Eurastus gives us an example of someone who's diligent in the world working, but you don't you know you're in the world, but you're not of the world. And nowhere do we see Paul say something like he did with Demas, where he says, he says, you know, Demas left to Thessalonica having loved this present world. He doesn't say that about Eurastus. He could have said, if this was a bad thing, he would have said, I left, you know, uh, you know, Eurastus stayed in Corinth because he loved this present world. He didn't say that. So even though he's, he's in the world, he's not of the world. I think it's a great example of something like that. You know, God calls us all for our, we all have a ministry, whether it's traveling and going to, you know, different countries or different areas, but we also can be a minister of the gospel in our present lives, in our neighborhoods, in our jobs, we can shine the light in the darkness, even within, you know, our, our, our little, you know, our little life. And so, so God, it's really a matter of the heart. That's what I was thinking. It's, it's a matter of the heart. God wants your heart. He doesn't, he doesn't necessarily care that you're doing all this work traveling around unless he calls you to do that, right? It's a matter of the heart. If he calls you to be the steward of the city, you know, then that's what he's called you to do. And you can be a light in the darkness in that, in that place. So I think that's kind of fun that we can use that and we can really pertain that to our life. All right. So Trophimus now, he says, Trophimus, I have left in Miletus sick. So this is um, like Tychicus. If you read through Acts, uh, the book of Acts in Acts 21, 29, Trophimus is mentioned as Trophimus the Ephesian. So Acts 21, 29 tells us that he is from Ephesus and we don't see anything about Trophimus until after Paul uh, is, is in Ephesus for three years on his third missionary journey. And then after that, Paul starts, uh, uh, Trophimus starts traveling with the apostle Paul. So we know that Trophimus was uh, a convert from his missionary journey in Ephesus. And so that's, that's here. Now this is just like Tychicus. We'd studied about Tychicus earlier on a couple weeks ago, same group where he had Tychicus, he had uh, Trophimus now, and, and many others are, are leaving with the apostle Paul on the rest of his journey. And so we actually see that, you know, in as he traveled on his missionary journey, on his third missionary, on his third journey, um, we know that he, uh, he went from Ephesus and then we know that he traveled up, you know, he went up to Thessalonica, he went back, back down to Corinth, went back up to Thessalonica, then he traveled in through Troas. Actually, and I think if I remember right, Troas was where Paul was preaching and then he, that guy fell out of the window. I think that was in Troas. That was on his third missionary journey. Anyway, Trophimus is there. Uh, he's mentioned as being, you know, kind of on this. And so Trophimus is following him around and then Trophimus uh, is with him when they stop in at Miletus and talk to the the elders for Ephesus. And then from there they go down and they go to Jerusalem. Now, Trophimus is right there with the apostle Paul as he goes down to Jerusalem. And now we know Trophimus is a Greek. He's uncircumcised and he goes down to Jerusalem and he, and we know, you know, there was chains and, and tribulations awaiting Paul in Jerusalem. So, but Paul goes ahead, he cleanses himself and he goes into the temple. And, but these Jews from Asia, it tells us in Acts, followed them down. And this is just how relentless these people were. Jews from Asia followed him to Jerusalem and they saw Paul go into the temple and they assumed that Trophimus went into the temple with him. And because Trophimus was an uncircumcised Greek, that's what really started the whole uproar. They drag Paul out of the temple. They start beating him to death. The Roman guards, you know, ar arrest Paul, actually save his life. But Trophimus was right there. Now he didn't go into the temple, but they just assumed that he did. So that's where we see Trophimus mentioned there. Now from that point, we don't see Trophimus mentioned anywhere until this book of Second Timothy. So what I'm thinking is that he was in Jerusalem. The apostle Paul got arrested and he was there, you know, in prison for four years. And, you know, he went to Caesarea and then over to Rome. During that time, I think that uh, Trophimus probably went back to Ephesus. That was his hometown. You know, he's a Gentile. I would imagine he probably went back to the church at Ephesus while Paul was in prison. Now, but then we do see that there is proof that Trophimus started following the apostle Paul again because he tells him that 
he, Paul says, I left Trophimus in, in Miletus sick. So that means if he was going to leave Trophimus somewhere, that means that Trophimus was following the Apostle Paul, right? So after Paul gets released from prison, he, I think there's several instances where he could have come back to Ephesus, picked up Trophimus, and then Trophimus is traveling around with Paul again. And then this is what I'm thinking is, is you know, on, on pa Paul's travels, Trophimus ends up becoming ill and becoming sick. He can't handle the road because that's a very hard road. And and Trophimus being from Ephesus um, probably had family in Miletus. That's, uh, I'm guessing that's probably why Paul left him in Miletus. So Paul drops him off and leaves him in Miletus uh, because he was unable to travel with him in the road. And then Paul goes on to the rest of, of his journey. And so that's my conjecture on Trophimus. Now, just an interesting thing to think about Trophimus. I left Trophimus, you know, I, tro Trophimus I left in Miletus sick. So this is the great Apostle Paul. If Trophimus was sick, why didn't he just heal Trophimus? Why didn't he just you know, miraculously heal him? He actually left him in Miletus sick. Now this word sick is astheneo, and it means without strength. And so this has been applied to spiritual weakness, saying that Paul uses this word in Romans that you were weak in faith or weak through the flesh. I, I was thinking about it. I don't think that that's what he's saying. I don't think he left Trophimus in Miletus because he was weak in faith. I, you know, I, and then I was looking at this word on how all, Paul used this other, way, other places. We see him use it in, in uh, Philippians 2.26 when he's talking about Epaphroditus. And he says that he became sick, almost died, but God had mercy on, on him and me, you know, so I wouldn't have sorrow. And obviously he was healed. And so again, we see there's another person in Paul's life life that wasn't miraculously healed right then, but, you know, God looks like did heal Epaphroditus. So, you know, we all know people and even have people in our lives that are sick. But I think this is an opportunity that we need to look at the sickness, the healing from the sickness isn't our hope. The healing from the sickness isn't what we dwell on because we know that by his stripes, we are healed. We know we're healed and being a Christian, we are healed, but you have to have healing in an everlasting eternal life mindset. Okay, whether you get healed in this life or eternal life, you are going to be healed and you are healed, but whether it manifests itself in this life, it's up, it's up to God. Ultimately, you have to put all this to God and you have to put it in his hands and you can't be hoping for that healing and get off base and hope for, instead of hoping for Jesus Christ. And I think that's what I'm trying to say. Our hope needs to be in Jesus Christ and everlasting life with him. And if you have a sickness or if there's somebody in your life that is sick, you need to be looking at eternal life now, if God wants to heal that person in this life, praise God. But you know what? That person is still going to die or we're going to be raptured, one of the two. But, he, but that person will always be healed for everlasting life forever. And that's the hope that we have to have. And so I think here as we're seeing this, we see Paul just give it all to God. Trophimus is sick. If God would have told Paul, lay hands on him and he will be healed, he would have done it, right? But obviously he, God didn't tell him to do that. And I can't explain why. I'm not telling you I know the answers. All I know is trusting God. God is, in, it, the healing is in God's hands and we will be healed healed when we all are resurrected and we have our glorified bodies and we live forever that is such that, you know the, the the things we go through in this life are so small compared to eternal life and that's the mindset we need to be having when it comes to sickness so I just wanted to take a little bit of time and share that with you um, because I think that might have been what was going through Paul but Paul had an eternal life mindset and we see that in here so now he goes on verse 21 and he says, do your utmost to come before winter. So he's talking specifically to Timothy and he tells him again, do your utmost. Now this is that word spudazo, make a maximum effort, spudazo. We saw this in verse nine when he says, be diligent to come to me quickly, you know, and then he goes on because he's alone and things like that. So this is the same thing. This is the second time that he's saying spudazo, make a maximum effort to come to me. Now he's saying now because, 
says, you know, come to me before winter. Now, a couple of reasons is we know that the, to travel from Ephesus to Rome in the winter, you couldn't do it. And so he had to come before winter in order to even make it to, to Rome. Um, also, it's possible that he didn't know if he was going to be executed before Rome, before uh, winter. And so if he waited till spring, there's a good chance he would already be, be martyred. And so he's telling him, make a maximum effort to come to me as quickly as you can and come to me before winter. And you, you, you remember, we talked, you know, he, talk, he said, make sure you stop by, bring Mark, you know, bring the, and ta- stop by and, and see uh, Carpus at Troas and bring the books and my cloak and and he's telling him to bring all these things and so that's the that's what Paul is hoping that his son in the faith will be be coming to see him one final time and that's why I said at the beginning you can see that this isn't you know Paul is writing this letter to build up Timothy in the faith and to strengthen him and encourage him and to hand the mantle off to him. But he's hoping that, that he can have a final word with him personally, physically, you know, face to face. And so that you can see that in here. Do your utmost to come before winter. So, and then also, this isn't the first time he's mentioned it. We saw it in verse 9, but then if you flip back to verse 1, he says in verse 1, or uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 4, he, he starts off his letter saying this exact thing. He says in verse 3, he says, I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears. So the, at the very beginning of this letter, he's talking about, you know, I'm, I'm greatly desiring to see you one last time, Timothy. I'm writing this letter to strengthen you, encourage you, um, but I also uh, want you to come see me. And that's what he's saying here in this verse 21. All right, so then he continues, and he continues with another greeting. He says, Eubulus greets you, as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. Okay, so now, now he goes from, instead of, instead of saying what he did with Priscilla and Aquila in the household of Anesiphorus, he says, he says, make sure you greet those people, you know, because they live in Ephesus. Now it's the opposite. He says, these people that are in Rome, that are with me, now... I'm, they're sending their greeting to you. See, that's the, and if you look at the language on how it's written, that's exactly what he's saying. These people now that he lists here are in Rome and they're brethren from Rome and they're, he's sending the greetings from Rome to Timothy. So we don't know much about these, this last group of people, but we do know that they're all brethren from Rome. And, and I would conjecture this, that they're not fellow workers with Paul. And I don't want to be too harsh on these people because I have actually don't even know who these people are. Scripture doesn't tell us anything beyond this point. Um, but if they were deeply brethren with Paul, I think they would have been with Paul, like Anesiphorus, like Luke. I think they would have done that. They, you know, but now it doesn't say maybe they did and they were killed for coming to see him. I don't know. Nothing says that. But I don't think, I get the impression that these are brethren from Rome. They're in the Roman church, no doubt underground, and it's very a harsh place. It's a hostile place. But I don't think they're actually r- willing to risk their lives to be with the Apostle Paul. That's just my conjecture. I could be wrong. We could meet these people and they're, they're arrayed in, in glory because they were so faithful. Um, but scripture just doesn't tell us who these people are. Um, but we do know that Timothy probably knew these people because he's telling them, he's sending a greeting to Timothy. Um, and then the only person that we really have any church history with is Linus. Now Linus became the Bishop of Rome from 68 to 80 AD. And that's from Eusebius. Eusebius was a historian from the fourth century. And he tells us that Linus was the bishop of Rome here. Now, and we see he was a faithful leader in the Roman church. Now, the Catholic church says that he was the second pope to rule over the Roman church, but that is absolutely not correct (laughs) for a couple of reasons. Um, But the Catholic church didn't even start until the Council of Nicene and Constantine in 325 AD. So whenever they say that there's popes before 325, they're just fabricating that up because they're trying to say that the church has always been around, right? The, Peter was not the first pope. Linus was not the second pope. There were no popes until, until after the, the Roman Empire kind of merged with them and they started, you know, becoming uh, that, that, that collection. And so anyway, so the, the Catholic Church says that he was the pope. He's not. Um, not much is known about the other... He's not. <laughs> yeah, I think he was a faithful man. He obviously grew in to be a bishop of the church, but that's a lot different than a pope, right? We all know that. Okay. Uh, so then he goes on. 
Um, some scholars actually say that Putin's and Claudia were another husband and wife team, kind of like Priscilla and Aquila. Um, kind of interesting, I read some commentary notes. So a guy that I really admire, his name is Connie Bear. Uh, he wrote uh, some of this stuff about the life of Paul back in the um, middle of the 19th century. And really great guy, I admire him a lot. He's convinced that Putin's and Claudius were, uh, were a husband and wife team and that they, they actually came from Britain. Um, but that's all just conjecture. He actually has some evidence that there's some letters that show that. But my thing is, I don't think that's what, who these people are for the simple fact of how Paul actually writes their names. Um, if, if these were a husband and wife team, I think if you look back at verse um, 21, he would, he would say, Putin's Claudia and Linus and all the brethren, but he, he puts Linus in between Putin's and Claudia. If they were a husband and wife team, I think he would have put them together. So that's my thought. I, so I think there's kind of some colorful things we can think about Putin's and Claudia being this great husband and wife team. I don't think that's these people here. Okay. So now we get to the last verse of the book, and this is verse 22. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. So very common ending to the Apostle Paul's epistles. But I think it's interesting, though, that whenever you read it, you see there's actually two benedictions listed in this verse. And you don't catch it unless you read it in the, in the Greek. So uh, the first benediction is to Timothy personally, and then the second one is to the church as a whole. So the first benediction, he says, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And this word your is the word su. It's the second personal singular pronoun. And it's specifically saying this is your spirit. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Now I think Paul's saying this to Timothy personally. This is a personal letter. He's no doubt re, you know, thinking about whenever he, he, in, he said in verse verse 17, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message of the gospel might be proclaimed. I, you know, he's saying that type of a thing, that the Lord Jesus Christ will be with your spirit. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. That's what he's saying personally to Timothy. Now, and then he goes on and he says, the second benediction to the church as a whole, he says, grace be with you. Amen. This you is humon. And it's not the word, it's not singular, it's plural. So the way we would actually translate this is this you, he would say grace be with you all, amen. And so I think that's kind of fun to see that. I wish they would have translated it like that. They should have said, you know, that, that the Lord Jesus Christ will be with you, specifically Timothy, and now the church as a whole, grace be with you all, amen. So just some fun things to look at in the grammar. But he's giving two benedictions. So this ending salutation is, is a common salutation, a, a common ending, uh, and it always ended with grace. Whenever you look at the Apostle Paul, all of his letters, all 14 letters end in this very similar way that actually has grace in, in the ending in some fashion. They're not all identical, but they all have grace in the ending. And so this is his trademark. This is how you know the letter was from Paul. And so many people actually argue this whenever they talk about Hebrews and even these pastoral epistles because the, the linguistical style is different. We talked about that. That if, So even though Luke is with the Apostle Paul and probably you know, helping him be a co-author with, with uh, Paul and, and even Paul had an amanuensis like with the book of Romans, he still, this is his letter. This is his thoughts, his heart going out and he always ends this last thing with grace in the end. And if you read 2 Thessalonians 3.17, he explains this. He says, the salutation of Paul with my my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. So this is how you know it's from me, is this is a sign in every epistle, and he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. So very similar to what we just saw in 2 Timothy, right? All right. So from this point on, the question is, did Timothy ever make it back to Rome to see the Apostle Paul. We saw how earnestly the Apostle Paul wanted Timothy to come back, but there is no church history saying that he did or didn't. So, I, you know, we know that Paul from church history, we know that he went on to his death and he was, he was martyred by decapitation. We know that from church history. 
But do we, uh, do we know that Timothy ever made it back? I would like to think that he made it back. I mean, Timothy w- it was such a faithful son, and, and he traveled with Paul, and Paul was earnestly desiring Timothy to come back. So I would like to think that he did, but we know that if he did do that, would, his, would it, he end up like Onesiphorus and giving his life for that, you know, for coming to see him? So as I was thinking about that, you know, here you got the Apostle Paul requesting his son in the faith, a very dear friend, and somebody who's going to carry on the work of the gospel, why would he actually risk Timothy's life to bring him back to Rome? You know, I was starting to think about that. This kind of seems like, is Paul really thinking right? Is he, you know, is he risking the, the, this Timothy to come see him one last time? And does that seem kind of selfish? Well, absolutely not, okay, that's not, but I think those things were kind of going through my mind, like, I, I'm, I'm surprised that, you no, know, this, this Rome is so hostile, I'm surprised he's bringing him back to Rome. But if you look at how the, what he's saying in this second Timothy, he's imploring Timothy to come, and he even says, share with me in the sufferings of the gospel. So he's, he's obviously not concerned about this, and I think this is kind of a fun thing to think, that this again is Paul's eternal life mindset and committing his life for God and the work of the gospel. If you look at, remember in uh, Acts 20, we, I love that verse. We've read it several times through this study of, of uh, 2 Timothy. But whenever he's coming down and he knows chains and tribulations await him, even death awaits him. But remember he says, none of these things move me. This is the Apostle Paul's mindset when it came to giving your life to preaching the gospel. This is what he's telling Timothy to do. So he has no, it's not like he's being negligent. It's just he is so focused on God's will and and doing this stuff that he's not concerned about whether he's going to give his life for doing these things. You know, you just see this drive that the Apostle Paul has. And I was even thinking about this in uh, 2 Timothy. He says something similar in verse... um, in verse 12, he says, so one twelve, he says, for this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. He's putting all of his trust in God. He says, I know that he's, he's, keeping, he's committed his life to God, and so he's fully persuaded that he says, God has my life, I've surrendered to him, and he is keeping it until that day. Now, whether that day comes you know, you know, sooner than we would think, he doesn't, he's not, he doesn't seem to be too concerned about that. He's just giving his life to preach the gospel, and I think that's what he's portraying to Timothy. Don't be scared. Don't be ashamed to the gospel. Remember, we just read that here. Therefore, do not, verse 8, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. You know, that's his mindset. So I think he's purposely telling Timothy, you know, don't be scared. Don't be afraid of the testimony of our Lord. Don't be ashamed, but share with me in the sufferings and trust God in everything that you do. I think that's kind of this mindset that he has, and we see that. So he's, he's going on to do the work of the Lord, right? In season and out of season. This is obviously an out of season time. In life and death, whether it's convenient or inconvenient, he's saying, preach the word and, and share with me in the sufferings for the gospel. This is the other reason why I think that he was so motivated in this is because I was thinking about whenever he first laid hands on Brother Timothy and he is, he's laying hands and he's ordaining Timothy in as the bishop of Ephesus. And if you notice, I want to read that. So 1 Timothy 4.14 four fourteen, he says here, whenever he's laying hands on him, He says, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. And then in 2 Timothy, it's verse 6, he says, therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So this is, they laid hands on Timothy whenever they were, uh, they were ordaining him as the bishop of Ephesus and he prophesied over Timothy. 
And we don't have those words on what he did. Obviously, he was imparted with this gift of, of leadership and teaching and those types of things. But I was thinking, I saw this painting and it really moved me because you see Paul laying his hands on Timothy. You have this dove symbolizing the spirit because he's prophesying over, over Timothy. And what, so what Paul is doing is he is putting so much responsibility on his son, Timothy, but it's not because he trusts Timothy, it's because he trusts God. He got a word from heaven, this prophesy, a word from the Holy Spirit to prophesy over Timothy, and he's giving Timothy now the charge to carry on the work of the gospel. He's ordaining him into the ministry, and so this is now, whenever Paul is writing these words saying, come to me quickly, regardless of, of the danger that's here, I prophesied over you, this is the work of the gospel. You know, it's almost like he's, he's looking, he's completely putting everything in God's hands and he says, God told me that you will be the worker of the gospel. You're gonna be ordained as bishop you know, and, and it's like he has no regard to the enemy. The enemy's been defeated is in, in his mind. This is the, the, what, what's going through my mind is that he has an eternal life mindset and he knows that he has been prophesied to Timothy to carry on the work of the gospel. And this is, this is God's work. He's putting him in his hands. And so I think that's kind of a, a neat thing to think that Paul is now feels fully confident to bring the work of the gospel to Timothy. So he knew this was the man to carry on the work of the gospel. And remember, he's the one that, uh, he's, Timothy's the only one who it says he deeply entrusted or deeply committed these words of Jesus Christ to Timothy. And I think it's because he had this word, this revelation from God to prophesy and to say that this is the man that's carrying on the work of the gospel. So think about this, this charge that the Apostle Paul is charging Timothy. I thought this would be a fun way to recap our look at 2 Timothy. We've learned so much, but think about, so Paul is, is ordaining Timothy to uphold the church, stand against the heresies of false doctrine and, and uphold the truth, right? And he lays on him countless times he's exhorting and giving him so many imperatives, so many commands to say, do this, Timothy. This is what you need to do. Timothy is now carrying on the work of the gospel. And so there's over 30 commands that the apostle Paul tells Timothy to do. Now, nobody without the power of God can do this. Then this is what I was thinking. This Paul, it's like he's putting uh, like undue pressure on Timothy, but he's not. He's actually, he's just following the spirit the Holy Spirit spoke to him and prophesied over Timothy and says, this is the man to carry on the gospel. This is what the man who does this has to do. And so Paul is, is saying this. So just, f I wanted to read these through you because it kind of helps recap what Paul was saying to Timothy. So we start in chapter one, stir up the gift of God, which is inside you. And that was the gift that he had whenever he laid his hands on him. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel. Hold fast the pure sound doctrine of Jesus Christ. Keep the revelation that was committed to you. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Endure hardship and suffer evil affliction as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Do not entangle yourself with the affairs of this life. Endure so that you will also reign with him. Do not make a war of words to no profit. Make a maximum effort to stand alongside God, approved as genuine, rightly dividing the word of truth. Avoid profane and idle babble. Depart from unrighteousness. Cleanse yourself from dishonorable vessels so as to be sanctified and useful vessel to the master. Flee youthful lusts and pursue righteousness. Avoid foolish disputes. Do not fight, but be gentle teach, be patient, correct, turn away from those who are of a corrupt minds and those who resist the truth, abide in the word of God that you have learned, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convict, rebuke, exhort, be watchful, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. <laughs> Man, what an amazing list there, right? That is something, only somebody that's endowed with the power of God can do this. But I want to tell you, we can do this too. We have the Holy Spirit. Greater is he that's in me that's in the world. We can do this because we have the Holy Spirit. Follow God, fulfill your ministry, and do this and stand against the enemy. That's what we can do. I think we can take this. So Timothy 
was faced with much hostility in this environment, right? We know that we had a hostility from the Roman Empire, from, from pagans, from Jews, for, you know, unbelieving Jews, from the Gnostics. And so he was faced with this hostility. But the root of the opposition was the doctrine of demons. It was those, the enemy, trying to tear down the pillars of truth. And this was a letter to encourage and strengthen Timothy to fight the good fight and lay hold on eternal life. So this is the letter of exhortation that Paul continually admonished Timothy to press on toward the prize of the high calling. That's what he's telling Timothy to do, to fight the good faith, to, to fight the good fight, to finish the race and to keep the faith. And it's all on seeking Jesus Christ. That's what it is. And so this entire book has one focus. And whenever you kind of look at this as a whole, the focus is this. The focus is on the truth of Jesus Christ. It's guarding the truth. It's holding fast the word of truth. It's upholding the truth, rightly dividing the truth, knowing the truth, teaching the truth, separating yourselves away from those who resist the truth and always having your focus on the truth. And who is the truth? If you're doing that, you always have your focus on Jesus Christ because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so no matter, whenever you're focusing on the truth, you're focusing on Jesus Christ. So I believe that this stance, this yearning for the truth, I think it can be summed up in one heartfelt statement that Paul told us back in verse 8. And he says, to love, to have loved his appearing. That's, I think if you take a whole thing, I was trying to come up with one statement that kind of did this, that summarized the book of Timothy. And, I, and I, all of a sudden it hit me. He's telling him in verse eight here, he says, you know, therefore I'm going to read this. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give to me on that day, but not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. That's the key to this whole book. Love his, his appearing. Love the fact that Jesus died for you and gave his life for you, paid for your sins, and that he was resurrected, and that we can have eternal life in him. That's how we lay hold on eternal life is we have loved Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you if, you, if you do those, if you love Jesus Christ and you love him with all your heart, then you will joyfully do these things that we just listed because we love him who died for us. Because it's not our works that's doing this, it's his work working through us, empowering us. So it's then that we can stand confidently before the righteous judge, having loved his appearing, having been proven genuine because we lived a life of faithful endurance to the end. It's then that we will receive the crown of righteousness and we'll hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen, right? Okay. <laughs> Let's go ahead and wrap up with prayer. Thank you, Father, for giving us your word to give us this precious book, that we can see this personal letter from Paul to Timothy. But again, it's not, it's not just to him because you revealed this to all of us that all who have loved Jesus' appearing, all those who have loved your son can participate in this. So Father, we lay down our life for you, to serve you, to be your humble servant, to, to go wherever you tell us to go, to stay wherever you tell us to stay, that we will always be with you, always be tied to you, and to do your will. And we, we look forward to the day that we can stand before you and receive the crown of righteousness because you were faithful to us and we said yes to you. So thank you, Father, for giving us this opportunity to know this book, to learn this book, and may we treasure it for the rest of our life. In Jesus' name, amen.